it was uh, that's one of the points that's really frozen in my mind. And I told the embassy that I'm sending Therese and the kids down to the ambassador's house, that rendezvous point. And uh, she came back, you know, we're talking radio. And I said, Laura, I'm sending Therese and the kids now down to the ambassador's house and over. And she's like, what do you mean sending them, Carl, over? We're all leaving over. And I said, no, I'm, I'm staying, Laura, over. And it's kind of quiet for a minute. And then she said, well, you, you can't stay. This is the, you know, this is like, an order that all Americans are to leave over and and I'm saying well Laura I know that as a private citizen I do have the right to choose to stay over well I think sometimes it's just really good you don't know what's ahead And uh, as my dad was pulling out, Therese and the kids were in the back of a little homemade camper I'd put on the back of my pickup truck. And they were pretty much sheltered from all of the horrible sights and things. I went down and opened the gate, and our road was a dirt road in front of the house. I remember standing there barefoot um, as they were driving away, and my neighbors looking confused because I was staying, but I wanted them to know I was there. And uh, when I said goodbye, I said, you know, probably two weeks, love. That's, that's Max, and um, little did I know that it would be three weeks before I'd ever leave my house. So were you ever in a position like we are now, like, where you were, kind of, you were worried what you wanted to do? Oh yeah, I wasn't even going to college. I said to my parents, I don't want to go to college. Well, my parents convinced me to do at least two years of college. And um, so I was taking industrial ed, auto mechanics, welding, that kind of stuff. And then I had the opportunity to go to Africa for the first time as a volunteer. It's a program they call Student Missions. And uh, I went to South Africa for a year. Worked on a, a high school campus there um, doing construction and purchasing and that kind of stuff. And Africa just got in my blood. It was just really rewarding, building schools, operating health centers, and that's what we were doing. By the time the genocide hit, we had been in Africa, the continent, for 10 years already. Did you feel a sort a sense of kind of responsibility to stay? For my wife and I, we had come to Africa to help. And, and it sounds simple, but if the people ever needed help, it was now. And I, I couldn't say to my, to my Rwandan friends who had already been there for four years together, building relationships and stuff, well, I'll pray for you. I mean, it's not, that's a great thing to do, pray for people. But for me in that situation, I could do more than pray. I could stay. Did you get, you say you stayed in the house for three weeks? Yeah, it was leave. like total curfew. You couldn't you leave couldn't the house? You couldn't move the house, couldn't leave. The only ones who were on the streets were the killers. It was quite... Um, quite eerie the first time to move out and around the city. These, uh, these people had, you know, emptied all the homes, the foreigners had all left, and so you had big, nice upholstered couches in the street that were set up as a roadblock. I went down to my office in the industrial section in our warehouses, and it was totally looted. All of our computers, the pharmacy vehicles, everything was gone, and as we were there, snipers, bullets were ricocheting off the shipping containers and so certain sections of the city were just chaotic like that other sections there were people living trying to go on with normal life and see when people think of Rwanda they must they think ah, must be some strange they're just different from us I mean I could never kill my neighbor you know and we think all of these things and yet if anybody would take time and visit the country like any country you go to you find people are people Men love women and they love their children and they want their children to have a good life and those general basic concerns are shared all around the world and, and in Rwanda people incredibly hospitable, um, generous and so I want people to know that, that before I ever helped any Rwandan during the genocide they were guardians over the lives of, of our family. It was our neighbors who saved our lives right at the beginning. The second night of the genocide, after they had spent the previous day just stripping apart like a big home, it was almost like a chateau two houses down from us of a Tutsi. 
looted the house and everything. They came to our house at night, unbeknownst to us. And it was our neighbors who were at the gate who said, don't go in there. And I could tell you more stories about people who were just so selfless during that time. And those are the people I choose to focus on and not to be devastated and depressed by all the other people who betrayed family and friends. Was there ever, those, I'm sure, fear? How did you overcome the fear of? When the bullets are flying and the guys are right around your car with machetes, it was terrifying. It was only when I finally said, okay, God, I, I, I trust you. I trust if I die, I trust you. When I finally made that commitment, um, that was like the real peace that came to me that took away the fear. And, uh, and so that freedom from fear, man, there's nothing like that. You know, I, when I tell the high school kids I work with, you know, they're like, what am I going to do in college? What am I going to do with my life, Pastor, you know, and what's this and stuff? I said, look, I'm on my third career. And, <laughs> and, you know, first I was a school teacher, and then I was this development aid worker in Africa, and now I'm a chaplain and, and pastor, and I don't know what will be next. But I think it's just so important. So many people go through their lives thinking, well, I'll work to kind of support this. I need to find a job so I can earn enough money so I can really do what I like. And I'm like, no, don't do that, man. There's so many things that we can do in our lives and we miss so much of it because we're afraid to trust. We're afraid to take risk. I'm running madly, I don't really know from what. I've been living my whole life like some phrase at the tip of my tongue. You know, really, we don't have to prove anything to anyone else. We just have to live as we believe we're called to live. And, and that's incredible freedom because fear is in so many ways. I mean, it's not just bullets. Am I going to live up to my parents' expectations? I'm afraid I'm going to let somebody down here. I'm afraid I'm, I work so hard for this and then I'm going to lose it. You know, all of these fears, it just can dominate and just destroy your life. So you can live your life with one fear or another, or, or you can live your life believing that there's good stuff, that you have made good choices as best as you can make them, and then you just live.